manufacturing himself, John Cook. It's my pleasure to lead off, and uh, really what I'm trying to do here is establish a background tax for manufacturing in Australia and the need for improvement. Okay, and no apologies, the material I'm going to present is real. It comes from people who are experts and uh, write articles and are interested in preserving, like I am, manufacturing in this country. I don't see any reason why we can't do that and do it very, very well. I get all the stories about costs and the like, and I think, well, how then do Germany and Sweden do it? Because they're a whole lot smarter. And uh, an interesting statistic I learned about this time last year, uh, and I didn't mention this at the next time, was um, that Sweden, with half the population, generates the same GDP as Australia. So twice the output. What's more, Sweden has eight companies in the Fortune 500. We have none. And that uh, came my way in the week of the Australia Day um, holiday. And of course, on the weekend, my wife said, Can we go to IKEA? So I turned over to uh, really turn IKEA, and I reckon 3,000 other people were there too. And they just reminded me how successful they can be if they have to. And we need to follow suit, so I mean. Oops. Yeah. Oh, Very right. sensitive. Very sensitive. These are some figures I dug up uh, about um, our productivity. Now you can see on the left here, labour productivity, the rate of growth, if you like, in labour productivity is, uh, has been pretty poor the last few years. We're actually uh, going backwards. That's not very good at all. We've come from a fairly high base in earlier years, in the 90s. If you look at multi-factor productivity, and this is capital plus labour, if you like, this is a mixture of um, sectors, manufacturing is included in there. I, I, I do have some figures on manufacturing, but um, not across both, um, both uh, measures. Uh, but you'll see that um, our multi-factor productivity has gone, rate of growth has gone negative. We're going backwards. Sort of worries me that people are not investing and they're not training. And I was reminded of that just a couple of weeks ago. I was walking through the office. We have an apprenticeship group on the level 11 where I work in North Sydney. And just I just overheard a conversation. Now, I knew that in 2014-15 that Apprenticeship take up had dropped off about 32%. This guy was making a comment about how it was still declining, so I stopped and engaged him for a few minutes, and it's still going like that. What's going to happen in five or ten years' time? I mean, we already have 200,000 457 visa uh, employees in Australia, and we're not training the younger people to follow them. That's pretty sad. So we we really dropped the ball, and that was 2009. And uh, I've seen reports and you know, Telstra and uh, banks, some of the banks and the government departments do these things. Um, and, and unfortunately, they don't all use the same methodology. But it's showing that our productivity is still falling. And you know, uh, in 2009, as in 15th place, we were one spot in front of Turkey. Well, I don't think that's anything to be greatly proud of. They also found that report, there's a clear link between the quality of management and enterprise productivity. And I put that there because that's, that was a very clear outcome in that report, and if you're managing a business, you ought to be aware that what you do or don't do has immediate impact and significant impact on the productivity and the, the, the profit, uh, profitability of the like of your company. It's right there, it rests with you if you're the manager of that company. Um, the report also says that uh, whilst we're not uh, in the top rank necessarily, we're not amongst the worst, but I mean, you know, we are the worst. Uh, we wouldn't want to be there anyway. I mean, we're supposed to be a first world country. We, uh, so we're supposed to have good universities, good take colleges and the like. We ought not be amongst the worst. Students come from other parts of the world to study and learn in Australia. Are we really capable of teaching them? I suppose is another question that arises out of that. We're pretty good at operations management. Um, I could qualify that, but I'd be offering personal opinion. Um, it, I think whilst we're not bad, um, and I've seen some, some reports that suggest we're pretty, uh, pretty strong on the uptake of things like lean. I've seen a lot of lean implementations. I mean, I've done it about four times myself in different companies I've managed or managed past thereof. We only go so far in, in applying lean. It tends to be a a tools-oriented implementation, um, not a cultural one. And I think, uh, you know, after you've been doing lean for a year or two, you ought to really be uh, inculcating cultural change into your business and developing creativity. Because lean provides the catalyst for the springboard for a lot 
lot of improvement. If you're just doing using the lean tools and there's a worry about that, you're really not doing much at all. You might well be spending money and going that way. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the hierarchy of, of uh, company studies, family owned businesses were found to be really way behind. And you can, it's not hard to imagine why. Um, the multinationals were leading the way, and this report suggests that where the multinationals are involved, um, we have fairly good management. That doesn't mean there's not room for improvement. But we're very weak at instilling a talent mindset. What do you think that means? How do you interpret talent? I keep hearing this from HR people, it really riles me, but um, <laughs> what does talent mean to you? You don't hire talent. What is talent? Well, I have a view that, um, and I've seen this in many companies, bigger and larger, uh, bigger and uh, larger and smaller, um, it tends to be focused more on technical skills. So in a mining company where this was consulting a few years ago, they were very keen uh, to have talent, if you like, in uh, geology and mining operations and the like. To get that all together was another thing. There's also talent, we talked about at the managerial ranks, and um, you know they were very weak in that area, and they began to realise that they were, it was a very good company, about 10,000 employees spread across the world, and uh, we looked at the top 280 jobs around the world, that range between Canada, Colombia, uh, here in Australia, in uh, Queensland, and New South Wales, and South Africa, and the Congo, and Zulu in Switzerland, and all that sort of thing. And that's where they were weakest. They weren't weak on the ground so much. Uh, in fact, I was telling Tom just a moment ago, I think, uh, that that company had 140 students, or sponsoring 140 students in the, the mining faculty or school over at the University of New South Wales. So they were, mind you, they, they managed to hold fewer than five each year. Most of those kids were not working for Rio Tinto and others. Why? Because this particular company sponsored them through the university, but then didn't offer them uh, Christmas time jobs. Rio walked in and picked them up, and they said, "Oh, stay here. That looks good." So the talent, the managerial talent, wasn't so great. Here's the these are the 18 criteria against which uh, Australia was benchmarked, and uh, you can see on this one here, the blue line is uh, very much towards the bottom. That's our talent, our ability to foster talent. Not very good. Long way to go. And you know, I keep hearing the government. There are ads on the radio, <coughs> on TV. I think at the moment, to, to Malcolm Turnbull's advocating we need more innovation and the like. But I don't know how we're going to get it unless they actually do something for the people. Um, and uh, other reports show that uh, we're pretty good on a, what's called the Global Innovation Index. So we recognise that. Picture there, right? um, so we're about 11th. We were at the time that this survey was done, 2014, um, and that would represent, say, 2013. So we're pretty good at the R&D. Spent a lot of money on it, 30 billion dollars and the like. And in fact, manufacturing leads the way. I don't know whether you realise that. Um, if you add up all the numbers, you'll see that uh, all the R&D in this country, of all the R&D, I think manufacturing accounts for about 26%, mining about 25%. And then, you know, it's an amalgam of other industries and sectors after that. But manufacturing still leads the way. I have to admit that I often ponder that number and wonder if uh, that 26% um, that, uh, isn't mostly comprised of uh, uh, tax uh, claims, the 45% tax rebate, and I wonder just how uh, innovative and creative that is. But anyway, uh, it represents people having a go, which is a good thing. The problem is, and we were talking about this just a little while ago, we do all this research and we're running 116th out of 142 for efficiency in converting research into innovation. Now we have three people here today from BioGill. I'm going to embarrass you if I ask you to just very quickly tell us what's happening in BioGill. I can tell the story otherwise I deal quite a lot with Steve Atherton. Okay, um, Steve Atherton isn't with BioGill anymore. That's right. Um, what do you mean what's happening with BioGill? How are we going as a business, how are we growing? Well, just very quickly, where it came from, where it's going. Um, Biogo was developed from the Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation, ANSTO. Uh, we bought it in 2009 um, and commercialised the technology and bought the patents and converted them into our name. Um, at the moment, we've opened up in Singapore. We're opening in China in March, but we'll keep the manufacturing of our membrane at our Tampoint office uh, to protect our IP. 
Uh, we expect to open an office in the USA in September <coughs> or October this year. And who owns the company? Which, you know, where's the basic ownership? Um, my father owns um, majority, my, my family, um, as well as we have investors BW Group um, through Green Marine Capital and uh, looking toward getting uh, more investment in about a month or two months. Um, and the figure of about seven to twelve million dollars to grow, grow the business internationally. So there's an interesting case of some uh, commercialization, real commercialization that came out of research at Ansto. Really good. Yoren Roos, I don't know whether you know Yoren Roos, uh, one of the, the other academic that would be right up there with Roy Green. Uh, he quoted an example, this was at a talk he gave last year, where he said the Victorian government uh, had invested something like $10 billion over roughly 10 years and received really no income from it because all of the startup companies were then uh, sold off offshore. So we're investing very heavily up this end, but not necessarily accruing the benefits. This came out a week ago. I'm sorry, it's very busy, but it's fine. But the point is, as measured in 2015, we're still 13th. We haven't moved anywhere. My concern, and we won't go into detail, but I get both very close to the university sector. And uh, whilst we can, we often we rate pretty highly in terms of uh, R&D in the universities. It's almost just research for research sake. The universities really uh, win their game by just producing lots of papers. Yeah, not necessarily apply. Um, so there's evidence of uh, innovation in product production, but there's a failure to appreciate uh, innovation as a decisive competitive advantage. And that's different in Europe where they're actually leveraging off this. Okay, and uh, what they've learned in Europe and they're beginning to learn in America, I think you might have heard that Americans are, are onshoring again their manufacturing capacity or some of it you've got to leverage off your competitive advantage. So innovation leads directly to competitive advantage and to higher value-add businesses and better profits in the world. Um, Catherine Livingston gave a very interesting speech in 2014, and uh, she says quite plainly, and I think it's very true, uh, the technological advances in plant and equipment create only short-term benefits, and uh, we tend to think that way in Australia, that we just improve the operations and everything will be all right sort of comes with that uh, mindset of uh, cost reduction. And I've been watching that personally for 20 years and we keep thinking we can, we can actually compete with the Chinese or the Indians. Well, only if the labor content's maybe 10% or less. Okay, if it's 50 or 60%, that's really where the value is these days with the people and the knowledge they have. Uh, we can't compete on uh, plant equipment. We've got to have it in the people. So we need uh, to improve both our operational capabilities and we also need to develop better management and leadership practices. So it's two-dimensional. We'll come back to that a little later. Thank you.